to the Central Baptist Church if you would like to rise. We are going to sing some songs this morning.
such a love I can't escape Thank you, Angie, for that song. Draw me nearer, Lord. That is a uh, request that we should always be praying to to the Lord. That is, you know, something that we constantly need um, to to be reminded of. That we we need to be making sure that we are drawing nearer to the Lord. Thank you, Jonathan. If you would like to open your Bibles to the Book of Romans, we are going to be in Romans chapter number one. Um, finished up with First John last week, and, and what a great uh, series that was for me. I know the Lord really uh, convicted my heart a lot through that, um, and, and, and as I was studying through the book of First John, um, you know, Romans was kind of one of those books that also, uh, and, and we, we tied into it a little bit. We tied into uh, the verses that we're going to focus on today in 14 through 17, uh, in the book of First John, um, but it's just amazing to me, you know, how, how the Bible works, and, and I know that, you know, it's, it's, it's obvious, but how that it all just ties in uh, so well together, and, and so I've been thinking and praying about, um, you know, after First John was done, where we were going to go to. I asked last week if anybody had any recommendations. I got none. So I decided that, uh, you know, we, we would start in the book of Romans. Not exactly sure how we're going to go through it here. We'll figure it out uh, as we move forward. Um, but we're going to go ahead and read verses 1 through 13 to start off with. And then we're just going to do a little bit of uh, conversation through, the, the, through those verses, uh, just as kind of an establishing and an introduction. Uh, and then we're going to really focus on, you know, verses 14 Uh, through 17 this morning. So we'll go ahead and we'll read Romans 1, verses 1 through 17. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets and the holy scriptures, concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, 
which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ. To, be, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift. To the end ye may be established. That is that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. So here we are in the, in the book of Romans. We have this, this, this epistle, this letter written by Paul to the church in Rome at the time. Uh, and it's somewhere uh, around the late 50s A.D., so most you know, Bible scholars think it was written somewhere around 56, 57 A.D. And he's writing this letter to the church at Rome uh, where he is currently living in Corinth. Uh, he had been planning a trip to Jerusalem at that time. He had been collecting money. Uh, from the various you know where, where he, churches he had been visiting, and he was collecting that money for uh, for the people in Israel, for the for in Jerusalem, because they were going through a lot of hard times, right? That this was a a time in in Israel where if you believed in Jesus, that you were excommunicated from what your church family, like from you know the, the synagogue, from um, everything, right? So so when you accepted Christ there, it was really. Um, a big thing in that in that culture that you were shunned like this was something you you were going against their heritage so Paul had been collecting money and, and he was living in Corinth at that time and he was planning a trip to Jerusalem to bring them that money that he had been collecting uh, because of all the persecution and the church there in Rome was likely um, primarily made or started from the Jews that had been converted on the day of Pentecost and had gone back into Rome. And so they, over the years, the decades that they had been around, they had grown, obviously, and there were Gentiles in there. But it, it seems like it had been predominantly led by, by Jews at that point. And then in Acts 18, uh, there's mentioned where the Jews had been kicked out of Rome for a period of, you know, four or five years, whatever it was. And so during that time, the Jews had left the church because they had been kicked out of Rome, and then the Gentiles, the Romans, had kind of taken over the leadership of that. And then the, the Jews were allowed to come back to Rome. So you had a bunch of Jews that had come back into a church that they didn't recognize anymore, largely. Like, it, it, you know, cultures were different. And so the, the Jewish traditions, and we know that the Jewish traditions were very strong, right? Uh, Paul, throughout the book of Acts, and, you know, and Peter, and, you know, they, they, there's a lot of combat of what, you know, Jews say needs to happen, and, and you know, Jesus saying, no, they, they, a lot of this stuff is ceremonious, you don't need that kind of stuff anymore. So there was a lot of things going on around there. So a big topic that, that Paul talks about is unity amongst the brethren, right? We, we saw that in 1 John as well, and we see that throughout the New Testament, and through the Old Testament as well, I think that's an indictment on us as humans that we just don't get along with each other sometimes. And, and this is where, uh, you know, Jesus is focusing on a lot throughout the scriptures is like, hey, you guys are on the same team here. Uh, you, you know, this is how you win friends and influence people. You love each other. You're nice to each other. You, you, you deal well with each other. And when you have to deal with the tough subjects, if you have to deal with the things that um, are against the word of God, people not doing what they should be doing, you still deal with that in a way that you are hoping to reconcile the situation, not in a way that you burn it all to the ground, right? So that is one of 
um, the big topics that he deals with in here. Now, Paul also spends uh, a lot of time, and this is what the book of Romans consists of, is the meticulous covering of the gospel of Christ. Um, most people, most scholars and, and you know, people like would say that Romans is probably uh, the most important book of the Bible. Uh, because it is the book that Paul defends very, um, the, the gospel very meticulously. He goes through, like you know, a lawyer would go through, and, and there's a lot of time that he spends on uh, the gospel message and, and how important it is for us. And, and his defense and the explanation of justification through faith alone. Right? Yep. Justification through faith alone. That's how we get saved, right? Faith. Faith in the Lord. Now, this is Paul's defense throughout this gospel. And so he, he wants to make sure that it's clear to the Romans and to all of us today, still getting the benefit of this letter, uh, what we need to be focusing on. And that gospel is it. And it's carefully, he, he carefully makes that through this. So uh, Paul identifies himself there uh, in verse 1 as a servant a slave of Jesus, right? This, this carries with it the idea of, uh, of a person that had um, been a bond servant that had agreed to a certain period of time. They'd worked their time off, but yet they willingly came back to their master because of what the master uh, provided them and, and because of the goodness of that. So Paul uh, is saying that he is a slave of Christ. He is, he is a servant of Christ. And he is separated unto the gospel of God. This is what his purpose is. This is why he has been separated, sanctified, set apart, right? He is, he's different from the way he used to be before he knew Christ, and now he is separated under the gospel. That's what his message is. That is what he is to focus on. And, and also, I would just say as a side note, us too. And, and getting kind of into the word, the gospel, we, we view gospel as very much a church word these days, right? If you are uh, standing on a street corner somewhere and someone walks by and you ask them if they know the gospel, they're either going to say yes or they're going to roll their eyes and go, oh, it's another one of those Bible thumpers. We view that word as a church word, right? And, and that's where we've predominantly heard it and through the ages. But back then, that wasn't necessarily a church word, right? It, was, it just meant good news. And a lot of times it was a, um, you know, a message that came like during a wartime. Uh, so, you know, you think of, um, I, I don't know the story meticulously, but the marathon, you know, when, when the Battle of Marathon was won, and the guy ran from Marathon all the way to Athens or wherever, 26 miles, and he, he gets there, and he, he gives the gospel news that we won, don't worry, all is well, and then he dies because he just ran 26 miles. People that do that voluntarily are crazy, but another subject altogether. Um, but this is, this is kind of, this is what the gospel was. This is a good news message of a victory, right? This is, this is explaining to someone, hey, good news, this is great, this is what we just won. And that's what Paul is saying here when he's delivering this mess message of the gospel to the Romans and to all the other people that he went about talking to uh, throughout his various missionary journeys. Good news, folks, Jesus won. We won because of Jesus. And this is what we need to be focusing on. I am separated unto this good news. And so Paul goes throughout this message over and over. And then verse 3 and 4, just to kind of read that real quick. Uh, Concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. So once again, something that we've talked a lot about through John is that he was 100% man. Jesus was 100% man, right? And this is Paul establishing that. He was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. 100% man. But then he goes on in verse 4. Declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Also 100% God. And I feel like I, I, I say this a ton, but I also feel like that the Bible says it a ton. And so it's probably important for us to, to realize, right? Jesus was 100% God and 100% man. If you take either one of those aspects away, it totally destroys the gospel message. So he spends time on, on making sure that they you know, hear this. And then kind of as you go down in, in verse 7, he identifies who this letter is written to. 
he says that this letter is written to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. So oftentimes as Christians, especially Christians that have been Christians for a long time, we think of the gospel message as something that would go to unbelievers, people that are not saved. And that's who the gospel message is for. But Paul is directing this message, meticulously breaking down the gospel message, and he's saying, hey, it's for you guys. We, we as Christians need to go deep into this gospel message. We need to understand it as thoroughly as we can. It's not something that is just for people that don't believe. It's the first step, right? We, we need to be sharing this gospel message with people that don't believe. And we'll get into that as we move forward. And I think we all know that. But once again, intellectually versus living it out, right? Having the, the head knowledge, but actually translating that into the way you live your life. But it's, it's for people that have been saved for that aren't saved, people that have been saved for months, people that have been saved for years, decades. The gospel message is something that's important for us to understand and to spend time with and to go deep in. And then he mentions how that their faith there in the Roman church was known throughout the world. Like I said, Paul was living in Corinth. Corinth was an uh, important town. It was an uh, area that you know, all the ships came to, and, and it was a, you know, a, a financial a, a hub there that, that a lot of commerce happened in. And he's saying, listen, I've heard a lot about you guys. You've done some great work. I hear about your faith. Throughout the world, people know about your faith. And so he's building them up a little bit. He's talking about how that it's important and he's glad to hear these things. And then he tells them that he's praying for them. Right? This is a group of people that most of which Paul didn't know. Right? Most of the people that were in Rome, he, he had no clue who they were. Um, he had heard about them. He had heard about their faith. He longed to see them, he said. He wanted to be a part of their ministry. He wanted to get there and, and explain to them and to build into them and give them some, you know, hit, give them of his teaching. And, and you know, he wanted to get there, but he, he didn't know these people, but he was still praying for them. You know, we have a whole wall back there of missionaries that we don't know anybody in those, church, in those churches in the different areas of the, of the world. But it's still our job to pray for them. We, sure, we send them a few bucks a month, and that's helpful. It's necessary for the ministry, right? It's, they, they need buildings, they need vans, they need Bibles, they need all of these things as they do their mission work. But we as a church, we need to be praying for them, just as Paul was praying for this church in Rome. Um, he, he, wanted to really, he wanted them to know that. And then he identifies... Uh, how much that he wanted to visit the church. Once again, most of the people there that he didn't know, he had never met. And, and he said that there were circumstances that had held him back. If you've ever read the book of Acts, there's a lot of circumstances that happened to Paul that kept him from going to Rome, you know, namely getting beat up and thrown out of towns and chased out of towns and thrown into jail and all types of, of things that Paul went through during this time period of his life. Um, but, but he had been um, detained. He hadn't been able uh, to get there to Rome. So this letter is a way for him to contribute into their life and, and to give them information about the gospel and about Christ and, and also in preparation of him arriving. He, he planned to come there. Now we know that he ends up getting arrested in Jerusalem and he does make it to Rome, um, but not you know, in the way that he wanted to. He, he was a prisoner and arrested at that time. But... Now we're going to get into the actual meat of the message, right? Verses 14 uh, through 17, uh, the part that I really want us to uh, focus in on this morning, uh, the part that I think is, is important for us to understand. Uh, verse 14, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. 
And so we have three things here that Paul identifies himself as. And this is the title of the message as well, uh, if you're taking notes, which I don't know, probably no one is, I don't blame you. But first, Paul says, I am debtor. Second, Paul says, I am ready. And third, Paul says, I am not ashamed. And these are three things that we all need to be. In fact, we should get t-shirts made, right? I am debtor, I am ready, I am not ashamed. Important things for us to be in our life. First off, he says, I am debtor. And Paul identifies who he is debtor to. He's a, he's, he's a debtor to the Greeks and to the barbarians. So the Greeks and the barbarians. The barbarians are basically everybody that aren't Greeks. So just to sum it up in a way, makes it a little bit easier. He's debtor to everybody, right? He's not picking one group. Later he says first to the Jews and then also to the Gentiles. Um, but he, he's, he's, for, he's debtor to everyone. He feels an obligation to the whole world. 1 Timothy 2, chapter 3 says, you can turn there if you want to, if you've got quick fingers. If not, it'll be on the board here. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. It's God's will that everybody would be saved. That's what he wants. That's what he planned for. That's what he wants for every single person in this room, that if you have not accepted Jesus, his plan is for you to accept him, to believe on him. And so Paul knows that. And Paul says, I'm not going to pick and choose who I'm going to preach to. I'm not going to, you know, pick the people that I like, the, the, just the smart people, right? Because Paul was a smart guy, right? He was very educated. He was very learned. He knew a lot about the Bible. He knew a lot about the Old Testament. Uh, he had spent a lot of time at the feet of, you know, important teachers. You know, Gamaliel was like the teacher of the time. And Paul had, had studied under him. And so he was a very... But, he, he wasn't just a debtor to the wise people, but also to the unwise. He was no respecter of persons either. He wanted the whole world to know because he knew that that was Jesus' plan and that was God's plan and that was what the goal was. So first off, he, he shows himself as debtor to the all. Then secondly, he uses this term debtor, which kind of seems a little odd. There's two ways to get in debt, right? One way is the fun way. OPM, right? Spending other people's money. Just borrowing and borrowing and borrowing and borrowing and spending it and having a good time, right? That's one way to get in debt. But I don't think that's what Paul's talking about here, right? The Bible's clear about debt. This is a whole side lesson, you know. Dave, I'm a Dave Ramsey kind of guy, so debt's bad, but slave to the lender. But that's not what he's talking about here, right? The other kind of debtor is... Um, when you accept upon yourself the obligation of presenting a gift to somebody, right? So, <clears throat> whoa, what was that? So, you think about like vacation Bible school, right? We, we talked to all the kids about bringing all their pennies. We put them up there. They were heavy. I talked about this the other day. I had five-gallon buckets, and I was trying to carry, and it was too much. I was weak. But we took that money from the kids that came to our vacation Bible school, and we were to give that money to the Lighthouse Children's Home, right? So we took upon ourselves the responsibility of giving this gift to the Lighthouse Children's Home. Now, we are indebted to them, and we didn't borrow money from them. We were given a gift that we were to pass along, right? We were given a gift, so we were indebted to them and to the kids, right? We had told them something, and so we were indebted to the kids that brought this money, and we were indebted to the Lighthouse Children's Home. And this is really what Paul is, is talking about here. Paul's talking about the fact that he feels indebted to all the people in Rome and every other city that he passed along the way and the known world. He felt like he was indebted to them because he had this gift that he just had to share. 
I think about Luke 7.41. Jesus is telling a, a um, story here, and he says, There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And now the the story goes on, and and it's a great study, but for purposes of this part of the conversation here, we'll, we'll stop with that verse. But he who was forgiven the most, right? Paul was forgiven a lot. We know Paul's backstory, right? He was uh, a Jew of the Jews, right? He was the guy that knew it all. He, he knew the law back and forth. And he thought he was accomplishing the will of God by doing what he was doing. But he was hunting down Christians. He was persecuting Christians hard. He was traveling around, finding Christians, persecuting them, throwing them in jail, beating them up, killing them. I mean, we know the story of Stephen, my namesake, right? He was, he was stoned to death. And Paul was standing there holding the coats, right? He was consenting to that death. He'd been forgiven of a lot. So he he felt that obligation, right? But what does Romans 3.10 say? As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. So we who have sinned, Once again, we'll go with everyone. We should feel that same debt. Sometimes it's a little easier, right? A lot of us, you know, never really went crazy and never did, you know, and hopefully none of us killed Christians, right? But we're no more important or no more righteous than Saul was when he was going around doing all that. Why do we not feel obligated? one of the biggest problems with the modern day church right we don't know what hardship is we got first world problems <laughs> we're not dealing with the kind of stuff that that Paul was dealing with back then but why don't we feel that burden we've lived a very posh life right we, we live we live a very life a life that you know we, we, we and we're busy Talked about that a lot. We, we go through life, we, we just always on to the next thing. We got to get from here, we got to get to there, we got to get to. I got a list of responsibilities in my lung. There's no way I could get it all done. We don't sit around. We don't allow, we don't, we're not still. We don't allow the Lord to get in our heart and remind us, like, hey, you're debtor to all these people around you. You should feel this obligation because you've been given a gift. The gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, through the blood that he shed on the cross. We don't feel obligated. 1 Corinthians 9.16, Paul's talking here to the church in Corinth that had a lot of problems in their life, right? They had a lot of things going on in in their church that weren't great. And and Paul is laying it out to them. And here in, in chapter 9, verse 16, Paul says, For though I preach the gospel... I have nothing to glory of. Yeah, I go around, I teach, I preach, I do all that, but I'm not, that's not something for me to glory in. For necessity is laid upon me. Paul's like, man, I do what the Lord tells me to do, but that's not something to glory in. I'm, it's necessary that I do that. I'm obligated to do that. I am indebted to do that. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. Woe unto you if you preach not the gospel. Woe unto us for not preaching the gospel. When was the last time you preached the gospel? Now I can get away with saying, well, I just did. It's not the same, though, is it? The one-on-one conversations, it's been a while. I'm not here to, 
you know, smack anybody in the face or, or to, you know, like give you a guilt trip or anything. But if this verse doesn't convict you, I don't know what will. Woe unto us. When was the last time you shared the gospel? Do you view the fact that Christ loved you first? That God sent his only begotten son to this world to be the propitiation. Once again, I love that word. That which takes away the sin, right? To be the propitiation for your sins. That he died. That he was buried. That he rose again. Do you view that gift as an obligation to share with others? Or are you just going to keep that gift to yourself? Woe unto us. And in verse 15, Paul says, So as much as in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. I am ready, Paul says. I am so ready to get there and give you this gospel message. A lot of translations use the word eager. Right? I'm eager to. I'm excited. I am ready to get there and to give you this good news. I can't contain it. It's so much a part of who I am, it just bursts out my seams. Every conversation I have in my life, I somehow got to get back to that gospel message. I'm thinking throughout my conversations that I have with people on an everyday basis. This isn't me, this is Paul, by the way. <laughs> I'm looking for opportunities to get this in the conversation. Have you ever met someone that loves something so much they can't not talk about it? It's a little annoying sometimes. Bengals fans. I mean, not that they're annoying necessarily, sometimes. But like, you know, somebody, that, that's the first thing that comes to mind. We're coming up on the season here, and, and, you know, everyone loves Joe Burrow, and everybody loves the Bengals, and people look in Cincinnati for an opportunity to, to, to stick that in there. Oh, yeah? Well, I know we're not talking about this at all, but what do you think the Bengals' chances are this year? How about them Reds? They're really tearing it up. It doesn't matter what you're talking about. If you are passionate about something, you find a way to get to that conversation. Paul says, I am ready. That's who I am. That's what I believe. That's what, it just, I can't not talk about it. I am eagerly looking for these opportunities. Now, what did Paul do to get ready? We've got a whole list of things that we can talk about that Paul did to get ready, right? Like I said earlier, he studied under, studied under Gamaliel. He was a very smart guy. He was learned. So he'd spent a lot of time studying the Old Testament. He knew what the Old Testament said. And he actually said in, in verse 2 there, uh, which he promised beforehand by his prophets by the Holy Scriptures. So this is what Paul did, right? He would go to the Jews first, and he would go through the Old Testament, and he would explain to them how that that message was Jesus. They didn't always get it. Sometimes they did, and sometimes they wanted to beat him up and run him out of town. Didn't stop him, kept going. He got a little off track there. But he, um, this is what Paul did. He, he, he studied, and then on that road to Damascus that day, what happened? He got struck by, you know, the sun brightened, and everything was bright, and he couldn't see. And, and, and he went to town, and he, in, in, the, in the town you had the Christians that were afraid to talk to Paul because, hey, did you saw at that point. Do you guys know what he's been doing to people? Didn't you hear that story about Stephen and those other guys? They didn't want to talk, but they did. They talked to him. They, 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 they showed him the way. They baptized him. And then Paul went off on his own, and he, he learned from God, and he did all these things. He spent this time in the Word of God, or with God, and, and in the Word of God, and in conversation and in prayer. And he did all of these things in preparation, and that's true, right? All of those things are true. But let me reframe that a little bit for you. What did Paul do? He lived a life without God for a long time. And then he realized that he needed God. He, what, all this stuff I had been doing, I thought I was doing right, but I wasn't. He came to that point in his life where he realized everything he'd been living for was wrong, and he turned to Jesus. And then what did he follow? Then he followed Jesus. Now, I know a lot of the details changed for us, but it's the same thing. We live our life for Jesus, or without Jesus, 
We realize we need Jesus, and then we start following Jesus. Paul's story and our story is the same story. Hopefully. God doesn't call those that are equipped. Because all the equipping that Paul had done to that point was not to serve Jesus necessarily. It was serving himself. Now, he used that information to point to Jesus, just like you can. Your life before God, your life before knowing Christ, that's all just stuff that you can use to point people to Jesus. Paul and our story, they're not that much different. He, God, like I said, Jesus doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. And let me tell you, if you believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you know Christ as your Savior, if you've asked him into your heart to be your personal Savior, you're called. Not a question about that. The Bible talks about that a lot. Go. It's the only qualification. The only qualification that you need is to have Jesus in your heart and to go tell. You are called. If you believe you're not only saved from hell, but you are also living a life, you, you are saved from living a life as a slave to sin. Right? The Lord has provided a way for us. We're overcomers, right? We've talked about that for weeks. Not only are you saved from hell and from death and from eternal separation from God, but you're, you're saved from having to live a life as a slave to sin right now on this earth. You are called to his purpose. And Paul is saying here, I am ready. Are you ready? Are you eager? Do you pray for opportunities? Do you look for opportunities? Is it so much a part of your life that you can't help but talk about it? Paul said, I'm indebted. I'm a debtor. I am ready. I'm eager. And then thirdly, he says, I am not ashamed. Verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. He's not ashamed. He's without guilt. He has no guilt in the message that he's sharing. It doesn't bother him to share this message. He's not worried about how you're going to hear it. He's not, he doesn't feel any guilt. He doesn't feel any, feel any shame. He doesn't feel any self-consciousness about it. He's not concerned whatsoever as to what the hearer is going to say or think or do. Evidenced by the fact that he would go from town to town and get beat up at, like several times. They, they thought he was dead. They were like, yeah, get this dead guy off the street. And then he, he, he wasn't. He, got, he was not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And praise the Lord, we don't have to go through that kind of persecution in America today. And we still don't do it. We can share this every day, all day, and people might roll their eyes. People might make fun of you. People might think that you're crazy. Paul, Paul was dealing with some real stuff. He was dealing with people that were chasing him down, conspiring to kill him, making up stories. But he was not ashamed. He was willing to stake his entire reputation on the fact that Jesus is the only plan that God had to save you and me. That's it. There was one plan. Jesus coming to this earth as a man, living a life, dying, resurrecting, going back to heaven, living on the right, being at the right hand of God, dying for our sins. The worst thing that we did, Jesus knowingly died for that. The worst thing that the worst people have done. Like we said, it's God's will for all to be saved. Jesus died for that. He made the decision to do this. And Paul says, I'm not ashamed. This gospel message that we're instructed to share to a lost and dying world is the only plan that God had. And Paul said, that is the power of salvation. That to everyone that believeth. That's how Jesus reveals his, the, the, the power of the Holy Spirit. 
And then we'll go ahead and we'll close with verse 17 here. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Paul says because of that salvation, the righteousness of God is revealed. The fact that you are able to be saved reveals the righteousness of God unto us. A lot of times we view the righteousness of God as what? Punishment, right? We view the righteousness of God as, well, he's righteous, so he can't have sin in front of him, so he's going to punish you. And that's the way the world would have us to view the righteousness of God, right? That he's, uh, you know, this big God up, distant, not caring, and he's striking people with lightning when they come into, the, you know, the house of God and, and, and they've done something bad last night. And, that, and that's how they want, that's the righteousness of God. But that's not what Paul's saying here. Paul's saying that the righteousness of God is revealed in the fact that we can be saved. The righteousness of God is him sending his only begotten son to cover our sins so that when he looks at us, he sees the blood of Christ, not our sin. That's the righteousness of God, and that's what Paul's saying. That should motivate you guys to be a debtor, to be ready, to be unashamed of this gospel that God has given to us to share with the lost and dying world. And woe unto us if we don't do it. We shouldn't get a pen on our, on our, on our shirt for doing it. That's what we're supposed to do. This is, this is what we're called to. We're indebted to this. Woe unto us when we don't do it. It's the gift of God. It allows us to be justified by our faith in his son. It's a beautiful thing, and it's revealed from faith unto faith, right? So it all starts, and it all ends with faith, right? Faith in the Lord brings us our salvation. Faith in the Lord keeps us. Faith in the Lord lets us live our entire life in the way that we are to live. From faith unto faith. Because it says there at the end of verse 17, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. This was a quote from Habakkuk 2.4, which I'm sure everyone is very familiar with the book of Habakkuk. You've read it, probably read it last night. <laughs> but basically, the story of Habakkuk is, in a nutshell, is that, uh, you know, that Israel was going to be punished and the Babylonians, the evilest people, were going to come in and take them over. And Habakkuk's like, wait a minute, they don't deserve to win. And, and what does God say? The just live by faith. If you're just, if you've been justified, if you've been saved, you live by faith. Understand God's in control. Understand that this isn't just a chaotic world with no, with, with no protection, with nothing. That we, you know, we talk about this in our prayer requests over and over and over again, right? It's a head knowledge versus heart knowledge thing. And, and God's reminding them, the, the Habakkuk there, he's like, the just live by faith. You have to trust the Lord. You have to have faith that he is in control. And when you have that faith, Paul's saying, you got to share that gospel message. This is what you're called to. This is what you should be doing. And this is what I long to do I long to get there to Rome so that I can do this in your presence, so that I can take part of your ministry. Because, what are those three things? I'm debtor. I'm ready. And I am not ashamed. So if you stand with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, we'll have a little bit of time here uh, in invitation. If you'd like to come forward and pray, the altar is always open. If you need someone to talk to, uh, we can definitely do that. Um, but a as, you, as you deal with the Lord here, as you pray to the Lord, as you think on the things that the Holy Spirit is doing in your heart, I don't know where you're at today. Maybe you've never accepted Christ, and, and this is the first thing that you need to do. This is where you need to focus this is the most important decision that you can make in your life. If you haven't accepted Christ, please do that. Don't leave without doing that. But if you have, if you are saved, Paul says, woe unto you if you're not sharing the gospel. This is what you're called to. We have to win souls, folks. 
I'll take any kind of addition to the church that we can get, right? We'll take people from other churches, <laughs> not proselyting or anything, but if there are people that, that, that feel the Lord's move and, and they want to serve in a different place, we'll take, that's not what we're called to. We're not called to attract people from other churches. We're called to bring people that don't know Christ and share the gospel with them. We got to get busy doing that as a church. We got to get busy doing that as individuals. Not because we want a crown in heaven, but because we've been given a free gift and it's wrong to hold on to it. Got to share that with the lost and dying world. So what words would you use to describe your commitment to sharing the gospel of Jesus? Would you use the words that Paul used? Debtor, ready, eager, not ashamed. All right, well, we will go ahead and we will uh, dismiss in prayer. I appreciate everybody coming this morning. I appreciate your attentiveness to God's word. And I, and I just continue to pray that uh, as you leave today that um, the Lord will, will work on you. The Holy Spirit will convict you that, uh, that it will become who we are as a people. Not just what we do on Sunday mornings, and, but, but our very essence. That we, that we could say these things that Paul said here. Fred, you dismiss us in prayer, please.